So when I first started this channel, I attempted to make a Halloween special in which I talked about Silent Hill 2. In the video, I just regurgitated a bunch of things people had already said about it, and left it at that. I've removed this video because I'm not super proud of it, and every year since then I've replayed the Silent Hill games but never bothered to make a video because I wasn't sure if there was much I could contribute. Despite this, I've always had the idea of dedicating every Halloween to appreciating one of the greatest horror franchises ever made. So starting this year, and every year in the future, I will be making a whole video just dedicated to at least one entry in the Silent Hill series. And that gives us, like, what, nine years to finish this series? Eleven if you count the movies? Boy, I can't wait. Today, we're not going to be talking about the one that everyone likes, nor are we going to be talking about the one that is vastly superior. Oh, shut up! You know I'm right! This will also not be a video about how four is good, actually. Do not expect it to be a video about how every other game in the series past 4 sucks complete ass and misses the entire point of what made this series good to begin with. It absolutely isn't a video about how Konami sucks and doesn't deserve Silent Hill because they completely fucked over Kojima. These are all videos I will make in time, but before we can get into any of that, we need to talk about the PS1 era. See, before Silent Hill, you had this game called Resident Evil, and many points in that game were about pressure, inducing fear through the atmosphere. Sure, you'd get the occasional jump scare, like getting the shit scared out of you by whatever the hell these things are, or a dog that jumps through a window and eats Jill's succulent and round ass. Sometimes you'd look down a hallway and see- okay, I'm ah! Despite this, I think it's shallow to act like this is all Resident Evil had to offer. Things like slow door animations, or the silent and eerie backyard-induced fear through unease, rather than throwing something directly at you to make you jump. This is why I disagree when people state that Silent Hill is different from Resident Evil because it's quote-unquote more atmospheric and less reliant on jump scares. I can see why it's tempting to want to differentiate the two, but in my opinion, Silent Hill is merely an expansion on this kind of game, taking it and doing something different with the same structure. I think acting like Silent Hill invented surreal or atmospheric horror is a little ridiculous and super dismissive of what made Resident Evil work to begin with. It didn't invent atmospheric horror, but it most certainly spun it into something new and different, and this video is dedicated to finding out how. The first Silent Hill game was released in 1999 on the PlayStation 1 and created by Team Silent, who were a development group within the Konami Computer Entertainment Tokyo Studio. It should be noted that initially many of the members of Team Silent were stumped as to how the hell they would even approach a game like this, to the point that the personnel were beginning to lose faith in the game. So because they had creative freedom, the developers decided that they would just ignore the initial plan Konami had. Rather than making a Hollywood horror type beat, they would instead focus on making a game that would appeal to your emotions. You play as Harry, a man with a severe case of autism who has a really bad car crash and then his daughter runs away into a town called Silent Hill. It's a mysterious town where the smoke machines were turned on so you don't see how bad the draw distance is. You must journey through the terrifying streets of Pennsylvania as you fight off really scary monsters such as children with knives and dogs that Harry somehow doesn't see. Explore sewers full of gross bug things and... Badgers? Run away in fear from really horny hospital workers and an accurate depiction of Drake Bell when he sees a child. Silent Hill is an excellent retro horror game with surreal monsters around every corner and lore deep enough to make you question your existence. I bring to you one of the most iconic games ever created, Silent Hill. Before I get too into this, I will be going over this game segment by segment. You can sit through the first section because it really doesn't spoil too much of what's present in the game, but after you finish this part of the video, I highly recommend playing it before you watch further because I will be spoiling things from beginning to end. If you absolutely have to watch more of this video but don't like spoilers, you can skip to the conclusion once this segment is over, but other than that, I highly recommend just playing it. It probably isn't surprising to my viewers that Silent Hill is one of my favorite franchises ever made. I like things like Dark Souls and Berserk, so obviously it's completely in character for me to sing the praises of these games, but I just can't help myself. They're an amalgamation of everything I love. Dark symbolism, atmosphere, world building, depressing stories with philosophical themes, and complex gameplay which makes me not have fun because I hate fun. Maybe someday I will have the courage to play first Silent Hill on hard mode, 
watch out guys the quirky youtuber is once again explaining to you how their taste is totally good please think i'm interesting the game begins with a quote in front of a picture of alessa the fear of blood tends to create fear for the flesh I believe this is straightforward in its meaning. You fear the sight of blood because it means that there has been damage to your flesh. You aren't concerned with the blood itself, just how it affects the flesh. In this regard, I would say that it's basically insinuating that the most potent horror you can experience is the possibility of something bad happening to your child or your quote-unquote flesh and blood. The introduction of the game flashes through various cutscenes you'll see as you go, interspersed with clips of Harry driving with his daughter. He almost runs into a girl standing in the road and they end up crashing. Next thing he knows, he wakes up in Silent Hill and his daughter is being a mischievous little shit by running out into the fog. The clips are accompanied by this brilliantly dramatic and grim guitar strum. It has a melancholic aura to it that lends the game such a beautiful atmosphere. I even like the little crackle noises, which is funny because I'm autistic and usually that kind of thing triggers me, but here it gives it this mysterious and haunting effect. I think establishing Harry's car crash through a little musical intro is a good move, as it allows us to just begin where he wakes up. In a way, you feel just as lost as Harry does. I feel like it's good at establishing relatability to our main lead. I will say that visually this game is not aged the best, although every now and then it has these FMV cutscenes that actually look quite ahead of their time. Things look super jarring when we switch back to the really outdated, blocky graphics. These FMV cutscenes are pretty, but they look a little plastic and lifeless at certain points, and it's not up to par with what Silent Hill would become later. As a PS1 game, however, it definitely holds its own as one of the prettiest games to come out of that era. It's just that the sound effects for a lot of these FMV animations are really weird. It's always some sort of strange shuffling noise placed over them that just doesn't sync up to the cutscene properly. In order to understand the story of Silent Hill, we first have to establish Cheryl and who she even is, since most of what takes place in the town has to do with her. I don't know how well I can properly articulate it, but Cheryl is the second half of Alessa, the woman that you almost flattened with your car in the beginning intro. I will not be talking about the events in Silent Hill Origins because that is a game for another year. What we've been given in the first game is a little confusing, but the idea is that Cheryl is the same as Alessa, but different. Not much detail is given about your daughter aside from the fact that she lived happily with Harry despite her mother dying when she was only three and she wanted to go to Silent Hill for some reason. In order to explain Alessa's story, I have to first go into each character respectively and what their role is. So I guess the most appropriate character to begin with is Harry, seeing as how he's the man you play as. Once upon a time, he and his wife found a baby and decided to take it in. Then three years pass and his wife dies, but because his daughter is a little small baby, she doesn't really react to it very much. Harry, on the other hand, is completely demolished by this, and the only reason he hasn't killed himself is because of his daughter. It is for that reason that he frankly does not care a frick about whether lizards or sexy moaning nurse ladies try to stop him. He will do anything to save her. At the start of the game, the player is beckoned to follow after her, and we're only given control of Harry for a few seconds before it's yanked out of our hands again. Some people might find this to be an annoyance, but I personally don't mind it myself. It's clear they want to direct your attention towards your daughter first and foremost to make sure you don't go running around randomly. Chasing her leads you to an alleyway, where the area gets darker and more narrow, making the player feel small and uneasy. Once you see your first corpse, you're trapped and forced to die at the hands of grey children. It's a segment that induces panic into the player, first by making them feel small and weak, then by forcing them into a hopeless situation that they can't escape from. It's a good way of introducing the horror elements, whilst also establishing the other world, which is a hellish nightmare dimension you occasionally get transported to. Leaving the player defenseless emphasizes the importance of combat, which is actually what you're given access to right after. As I referenced earlier in the video, the fog was not actually going to be in the game initially, but was used as a method of hiding the draw distance most of the buildings and other things had. And this ended up being a really good move. It's what makes Silent Hill so distinct and iconic. It gives the game the fear of the unknown, but the brightness makes it more melancholic and sleepy than if everything was just, you know, dark. The jarring bass noises paired with the occasional ringing also creates this familiar sense of unease right at the beginning of the game. The 
The fog makes the town feel so dreary and hopeless, but everything has such a sharp and solid color scheme that makes it pop out. I also think the snow or dust particles, or whatever the hell this shit is, really brings the visual style to life. As you work your way down this hallway, things start getting darker as the ominous sirens pierce their way into your ears. This is one of the best openings to a horror game that I might have ever seen. It's genuinely amazing. Harry wakes up back in the normal world as these bizarre, gloomy synths wail out in agony before being accompanied by this peculiar riff, really establishing the mystery of what this place is and what the hell is going on here. The music in Silent Hill is absolutely something to adore, like the anxiety-inducing series of notes punching you in the face again and again as the tension rises. <laughs> There's a lot of unique experimentation in setting the atmosphere through the game's soundtrack, and it's something to admire. The voice acting is not great, but it's not really terrible either. Many people have stated that the stilted, somewhat emotionless voice acting from the characters is supposed to add to the strange surrealism of the game. And that could probably be true, especially since there is no Japanese dub of this game and the dialogue is paced super awkwardly where characters take like, five seconds to reply to something. I'd like to find out myself. It's extremely strange. This is Sybil Bennett. She's a pig. A cap. She actually passes Harry on his way to Silent Hill and ends up saving his life towards the beginning of the game. To explain things simply, she's really only here because she's investigating an organization I'll touch on later called The Order, believing there to be some sort of drug trafficking situation going on. She gives you a gun and tells you this. Take this and hope you don't have to use it. This line is very important, as it perfectly establishes how Silent Hill expects the player to approach the combat. Close-range weaponry like steel pipes or knives or anything else are super fucking slow and leave the player open for several frames. And sometimes you'll hit an enemy and it just won't register at all, because there's seldom any recoil to your hits. Using your gun is much more effective, however there's an extremely limited supply of ammo. So because of that, guns end up being more of a suggestion. When you do try to kill enemies, you end up wasting a lot of your time, energy, and ammo. In order to finish off a lot of opponents in this game, you have to kick them, which can be a pain in the ass to do if you're dealing with hordes. But that's the entire point. I mean, you might cringe at how bad the combat sounds, but you're not really supposed to be fighting opponents. Don't go blasting me by mistake. Bruh. Silent Hill places a lot of emphasis on it being a survival horror, and everything the player needs to play the game is given to them in this diner. You're introduced to the game's use of save points, which you'll end up finding in certain rooms. You're also given a few healing items, a map, a flashlight, and a knife. Your health is determined by this flashing green tint behind your character's head. When it's green, your health is full, but the more red it gets, the closer to being dead you are. From the perspective of this counter, you actually see some weird flying creature through the window behind you. It isn't until the player attempts to make their leave that the radio on the nearby table begins ringing. When you go to pick it up, you're given your first encounter with an air screamer, as well as your first chance to fight back and defend yourself. It's a jump scare, but it works super effectively given how safe you feel in this diner before having that security completely demolished as soon as you go to leave. You're supposed to aim your gun with R2 and fire with X. It's not super practical, but I wouldn't say it's a bad gimmick for a horror game as it allows you to have the weapon at the ready whenever you need. Every time I enter a new room, my finger stays holding down that R2 button to prepare for whatever the hell may bombard me on the other side of that door. Conveniently, you're also introduced to the radio mechanic, which is easily one of the best ideas for a horror game probably ever. Any time there is an opponent nearby, the radio will start ringing as a warning to the player to look out. It's the perfect element for establishing unease at what might be lying ahead, whilst keeping it simplistic for newcomers. Most of the game is in third person, but occasionally it'll switch to fixed camera angles. There's a lot of intentionality to these, typically drawing your focus to something important. To many people who have played more modern titles like Resident Evil 4 or Evil Within, I'm sure this kind of gimmick can make one feel a little bit nauseated, but I also think it works to making the player feel insignificant. It's easy to say that the gameplay of Silent Hill is janky, but in my opinion that's precisely what makes it so scary. The challenge isn't in killing your enemies, but rather in conserving your ammo and knowing when to run away and when to fight. Once you get out of the diner, the game finally leaves you free to go wherever you want, but tells you straight up that you should probably go visit that alleyway you got trapped in at the beginning of the game. 
The amount of time it takes to load in a new room or a new area can often give me anxiety. In the Resident Evil games, the door opening animation was used as a cover-up for this, in order to give the player something to look at as they waited. But Silent Hill doesn't really do that. Instead, you're just sitting in darkness with no sound playing. In my opinion, it's just as effective at creating unease in its own way. I love the aesthetic of this game, such as the little note that plays when you pick things up, or the ticking sound when looking through your inventory. Many of the sound effects in this game, with maybe exception to the generic page-turning sound that literally every game under the fucking sun has used, offer such a distinct and oddly comforting effect to the game that really makes it satisfying to play. Now that you have more room to walk around comfortably, you can get used to the controls. Air Screamers are easily one of the more annoying enemies in the game. I mean, they're not really that scary, and the best way to avoid them is often just to stop walking entirely in order to avoid their hit detection, since they usually aim for where they predict your character is headed. This method is effective most of the time, although it becomes a hassle when they're traveling towards you in groups. When you go to the alleyway you started in, you're given a steel pipe, which is a lot more effective than the knife you were given in the diner. I feel you find it a little too early in the game, and it just makes me question why the knife is even here to begin with, seeing as how it's virtually useless. The steel pipe is a much better close-range weapon. Harry can either make a direct swing downward, or he will swing twice. If done effectively, the second swing will actually push some enemies back just enough so you're out of their reach, and if you get lucky enough, you can stun lock them and swing to your heart's content until they fall to the ground, allowing you to finish them off with a kick. It's a much more lenient close-range item than the knife, and the perfect tool for conserving ammo. One thing I absolutely love about Silent Hill is that it will mark your map for things you've discovered. Unfortunately, where this extremely helpful mechanic falls apart is that once you die, everything Harry has discovered is completely undone, and you go back to the last time you used a save point. This could just be my personal preference. Save points are not really my preferred method of saving. I generally like when a game allows me to do it whenever I wish. I tried to play Silent Hill on hard mode because I quite enjoy difficulty in games, but I ended up having to switch over to normal mode because of the constant backtracking and the fact that I'm not very good at this game. Despite the fact that the player is given freedom, much of the city feels really empty, and any paths you could possibly take to the school, which the game makes clear is your next objective, are completely blocked off. Despite this, you do run into a piece of paper that tells you to look for a doghouse on Levin Street which holds a key to a building with a door that has three locks on it. From here, the player is meant to explore each and every blocked off road, and see where they can find keys that open each door. And that's where you're first given a taste of what Silent Hill contains. But unfortunately, the large abundance of screamers paired with the janky controls usually has people quitting this game at this point. Nothing here is particularly as scary as it was towards the start, and it's very easy to just roam around finding absolutely nothing. I expressed it earlier, but I really have to reiterate, the Air Screamers are more of an annoyance than they are a real threat. Having to heal because one happened to swoop down and shit on you puts a pretty bad taste in my mouth. I can see why they would want to save their scarier enemies for later in the game, but I think it could have been a little more interesting than it was. Another issue I had was that I've gotten into the habit of checking the map every couple of steps, even if I just checked it, because there's no mini-map that gives the player a good indication of where they are, and the fog obstructing my vision makes it so that I have to make sure I know where I am as well as where I'm headed every five seconds. I think a mini-map would have been nice, although I guess that might make things a bit too easy. I don't think it's a big deal, it just was mildly annoying. The opening to Silent Hill starts strong, but then we return to the normal world, and it's a bit of a slow burner. Once you collect all the keys and open the door, you're ready to get back to the creepiness this game is known for. The dark music that plays as you make it to the other side of the door is super heavy with what sounds like breathing interspersed with really distant and hollow violins. Once you make it here, the colors get a lot sharper, and we go from the gray, dull lifelessness of before to the brooding, lonely, terrifying ambience of now. Things get darker, and you're seeing a lot more enemies than before. They tend to miss you if you turn off your flashlight, though you can't read your map if your light is off. The path to the school from here is pretty self-explanatory though, with it being optional to head the other way and grab extra items. 
I thought it was a bit odd to put a saving point in the nearby school bus considering you're about to get another one in the school. The start of Silent Hill is a little weird with where it places these, and they're seldom marked on the map either. Much of the time I end up having to memorize where one is if I ever want to stop playing, so I'll go to the one that's farthest away just because I don't know where the closer one is and I can't be bothered to risk my neck searching for it since killing enemies is discouraged in this game. I do like that the save points give you a wide variety of slots to save your progress, just in case there's a previous one you think you need to go back to in case you fucked up. Screwing up is probably one of the easiest things to do in this game because turning back is not possible in any of the areas. Alessa is the daughter of Dahlia Gillespie, an old crazy woman who was severely abusive towards her daughter, as well as a member of this organization known as The Order. This is a brilliant juxtaposition to Harry, who loves his daughter more than anything, to the point he's willing to risk his neck fighting monsters in order to save her. Basically, Dahlia's daughter has powers, so she constantly indoctrinates Alessa with her religious beliefs. She was brainwashed into believing that, in order to create a utopia, the world must be cleansed with fire. The first area you're meant to go to is Midwich Elementary, which is a manifestation of the same school that Alessa went to as a kid. All throughout the building are various grade children, which I think are distorted versions of the classmates that picked on Alessa when she was young. Many of them travel in groups, which probably means she was bullied and called a witch because of her really fucking weird occult mother and the fact that she has superpowers. It should be noted that apparently in the North American version of Silent Hill, these badger-looking dudes called mumblers are meant to replace the gray children because they apparently resembled real-life children too much. <laughs> Alright man, whatever you say, dude. Not all of these gray children are hostile. Sometimes you have invisible ones that don't do anything despite the radio you have treating them as if they're an enemy. And I interpret this as symbolic of how empty Alessa felt, like she was just a hollow ghost that everyone treated as a threat. It's likely she felt invisible, something to be completely ignored and neglected. The air screamers from earlier, which look very similar to pterodactyls, could be meant to represent Alessa's fear of dinosaurs from reading books. And I think this applies similarly to the various groaners outside, too. It's a lot like yet another animal that Alessa grew intense fear of, often being frightened by dogs that would bark at her. I believe these two enemies being all over town but never being in the school is intentional, especially since they're introduced around the same time. Later in the game, they both get upgraded variations of them known as Night Flutters and Worm Heads alike, both of which have worm-shaped heads, which could reflect even further on animals she was already afraid of by combining them with yet another creature that brings her disgust, worms. I think having this change take place later in the game also correlates a ton with the fact that Harry feels as if he's slowly losing his fucking mind, which is not far off from the truth. The school has a pretty cut and dry structure. You're immediately given a map that tells you where all the rooms of the establishment are, and it's your job to explore them. Some doors open, a lot of them will end up being locked. Also, the various gray children everywhere are evil. Playing this game on hard mode is a serious fucking nightmare because these kids have the hit detection of a time wizard on crack. Get used to them because there are two, sometimes even three of them in every room with absolutely no other fucking enemies. Even when the area turns into nightmare mode, you only see them and maybe a few bugs here and there if you're lucky, or unlucky since you can't kill those with a pipe, although I guess they do a lot less damage than fucking children with ni WHERE DID YOU EVEN GET KNIFE?! I also think needing to go back and forth between classrooms in order to get to the other side of a hallway is just a complete pain in the ass. And it's even worse if you have to backtrack for things you might have missed, which also makes ignoring enemies a little bit more difficult to do than it needs to be. Several points in the game have you killing kids, finding something, and then those kids respawning when you get back out, which is all the more reason you seriously shouldn't bother. Despite this, I recommend hard mode players ignore this advice at least for the school because the corridors are super fucking narrow and running past them is about as easy as trying to put your chin on your balls or vagina respectively. The most convenient way to traverse the school is to go clockwise around the halls on each floor whilst thoroughly checking every room as you go, which makes it tempting to kill every child present because they're just in your way. This honestly makes this one of the less enjoyable areas in my opinion, but it's not really so bad that it's unplayable. For the first segment of the school, you're looking for two medallions. The only hint you're given is a couple of really vaguely worded poems located at the reception desk right at the start, which is a pretty convenient place to put it if the player sees a need to come back and check, although I think it would be better to allow the player to take these pieces of paper with them so they can look at it whenever they need. The goal is to find any items you can. 
Harry chooses to pick up very peculiar and strange things, and half the time you won't even know what the purpose of them are until they become relevant later. Lots of rooms will have all sorts of stuff on the ground, but Harry will not pick them up or even acknowledge them. For this reason, 100%ing this game without a walkthrough can be a serious pain in the ass, because collectibles aren't really given any sort of standout from their surroundings, and it's super easy to miss them. But that's part of the fun. You're expected to be thorough and spend a lot of time making sure you check every nook and cranny made available to you. You find the first medallion trapped in this hand that you have to melt with acid you just conveniently found on a shelf like five rooms ago. I don't know if other players go about it the same way I do, but I make it a point to explore the entire first floor before I go to the second. When I first found this hand, I already had the acid in my possession. Though, given how vague of a line of thinking that is, I suppose many people might still be stumped as to what the hell they're meant to do. The game expects you to experiment and try using items on whatever seems interactable. You gain the second medallion by solving this piano puzzle. Many of the puzzles in this game will have the hint just right there on the nearby wall. You just have to read it and comprehend it, then figure out the combination. This feels a little redundant at times, but the premise of these puzzles themselves are really good, especially this one in particular. You're supposed to find the notes on the piano that don't make a sound, and use the nearby paper to determine what order you hit them. It's a puzzle I forget the solution to just about every time, so I think it holds up relatively well as a fun little brain teaser. A lot of the school is spent in complete and total silence, which I think really sets the mood before things start getting creepy. I like to think of it as a calm before the storm. Once you explore a little bit, you're given this descending series of organ notes that really bring the place to life. Every so often you'll be exposed to these shuffling bass notes over this cold, foggy distortion. It kind of sounds like someone trying to drown themselves. Once you collect both of the medallions, these intense, booming drums will tower over them menacingly. It's easy to know that you're not in danger despite the music, because the sound you should really be worried about above all else is your radio. But that doesn't change the fact that the music just makes me so uncomfortable every time I hear it, even though I know there's nothing trying to kill me yet. Getting the two medallions isn't all, you also need to go down to the boiler room and press a button. I don't really fully understand this, but it's in the notes at the beginning of the area, so I guess that it's somewhat justified. It still feels like you're just going out of your way to do more bullshit. There aren't even any obstructions or puzzles once you get into the boiler room. You just go in and press a button. I get why it fits thematically, but I wish there was a little more to it than just that. Regardless, you can finally make your way to Time's Door, which takes you to the other world. Once you make it there, it feels as if the attitude of the game has suddenly become more hostile. Appearing in the other world stresses me the hell out. The loud echo of your footsteps as you walk around on metal, paired with the horrific rusty decay, everything is this big hellish mixture of black, brown, and red. I recall this one room in the school had this giant fan that just scared the absolute shit out of me because of how fucking loud it was. Luckily, as soon as you get to the other world, you're immediately given a stress ball. At least Silent Hill is considerate of your mental health like that. There's this one point in the school where you'll run into a body stuck to a wall in the bathroom. I love the slow creak of the door paired with the chilling synths that fade in. It's really cool how often things in this game exist entirely just to fuck with the player. Like, in the other world, if you go into this bathroom and come out, you'll end up on the second floor. Little touches like that are very interesting, and it feels like the game is just gaslighting you. In the normal world, at one point, you'll run into a cat that runs away only to get eaten by some kind of creature. Hearing the thud of the locker makes you feel so uneasy, then you're relieved to see it's a cat before that relief is completely demolished at the fear of whatever the hell just fucking killed that thing. They play on this later in the other world where the locker is shaking again, but when you open it, all you see is blood. Afterwards, you're hit with this jump scare where a corpse falls out only for it to give you a key. It feels so strange having the shit scared out of you but being given something useful as a result. Things like this just make the game feel like it's playing with your head. I'm just crazy about that kind of thing, and Silent Hill does it so goddamn well. Despite the various things people might criticize this game for, it is genuinely a horrifying game. 
Two items you discover at the start are a card that unlocks a nearby door and a rubber ball you use to block a drain so you can utilize a waterway to make a key fall down into the courtyard. It continues that theme I referenced earlier of being given really strange items that may or may not be useful in the near future. Even when you get the key, you're not even really told where exactly it leads to. It's just a classroom key. In the normal world version of the school, the puzzles started off very simplistic and straightforward, but in the other world, there really isn't much present. You find yourself walking through rooms and discovering a rather healthy abundance of ammo and healing items, but aside from that, there aren't that many brain teasers outside of what was already mentioned. You you just have a lot of backtracking to do, and because hallways are all fucked up in this world, you end up going back and forth between rooms and dealing with really slow load times, making the other world version of the school feel a little drawn out. I do like that the game offers you a book that tells you the secret to defeating the upcoming boss in a really vague way. It's something you're meant to put two and two together yourself, if you even happen to run into this book in the first place. To the school's credit, there is this puzzle at the very end, where you have to turn these two valves in order to figure out how to open the doorway before you. It's not really a hard puzzle, but at least it's not entirely barren of content. Honestly, the other world segment of the school took me about 15 minutes to complete, which is underwhelming because it took me twice as much time to find the medallions and then figure out I had to press a button in the boiler room. The notes on the reception desk state that at 5 o'clock, flames render the silence awakening the hungry beast. You also cannot go into the time door unless you press a button in the boiler room. After you press the button, it makes this noise. If you've played this game, you might also notice that that very same sound comes from the boss fight that's about to come up, Splithead. It's likely that as a child, Alessa had a very active imagination and was terrified of the boiler room, believing it contained that lizard monster detailed in the story. And this could be why that's where the boss room is in the other world. I think the fight with the split head is pretty good. He's capable of ramming into you or opening his mouth and swallowing you whole, the latter of which actually kills you immediately. Despite how OP of a move that is, you can also kill him by shooting inside of his mouth a couple times with a shotgun, as instructed by the storybook. It's all a matter of who is faster, which I think makes it a pretty evenly balanced fight. If the vague story seems a little arbitrary for people who somehow didn't find it, don't worry, because he will die eventually if you just keep shooting him. That's probably why there was so much free ammo scattered all over the school, but I mean, come on, like, that's such an easy method to discover by complete accident, so it's not even like you really needed to read the story to begin with. The split head acts as a way of stressing the importance of going backwards and shooting at the same time, as well as not walking in a straight line, which is important to avoid monsters such as air screamers and groaners. It's not an especially difficult boss fight, as most people usually finish it within three minutes, but I think it brings everything the players learn thus far full circle, since the school is primarily just a big introduction to Silent Hill and how it works.